What's up, guys? It is Derek Kirby back with another Mavericks victory. I don't know what you would say. I almost said, like, Victory Monday, but that's a more Cowboys thing you would say. Unless they play on a Monday night, in which case it would be Victory Tuesday. But today is Thursday. Victory Thursday. Thursday. Yeah, let's go with that. Anyway, we got a three-game winning streak rolling now for the Dallas Mavericks. Things are progressively picking up a little bit. Now, there's a couple of things to factor into this. One, the schedule has gotten lighter, as we said it would, when we cautioned and urged people, hang in there. Yes, I know their struggles, and I know they've struggled against bad teams as well. But hang in there, this team can get it going against some lesser, shall we say, opponents. Now, Atlanta, they've got a talented roster, but they are hit hard with injuries. And that opens the door for Dallas to make some real headway. Now, they get that in the form of a 118-117 win, which is a continuation, really, of how Dallas's recent streak has gone. Every game has been within five points. The 134-132 win over Golden State, the 127-122 win over the Timberwolves, which I was not able to do a post-game show for after, just with how crazy my schedule has been this week. But I know there's a lot of good happening, but there's also still things that need to be worked on, things that need to be addressed. And even this game had that as well. But it's good to see Dallas winning these close games because it shows growth and progression in the clutch. How to win these close games, particularly when things have not been going great for you. In the case of the Minnesota game, they pissed away a big lead in that game. And Minnesota's not a good team. They're without Carl Anthony Towns. And so to be in that situation, not good. But they got the win. And you had Porzingis absolutely go off in that game. In this game, you're able to finally actually defend home court. That feels like a rarity this year. And Dallas gets another big-time performance. This time, I, I know he's one of the more maligned guys in here, in this kind of community and everything. Tim Hardaway Jr. deserves a lot of credit in this game because... He absolutely goes off in the fourth quarter. He goes off and scores, I think, 13 of his 16 points in the fourth quarter to erase in a nine-point deficit to open the quarter for Dallas. It was 90 to 81. Dallas not only erases that deficit, they do it in the blink of a damn eye because Hardaway opens the fourth quarter on a 7-0 run by himself. And he caught fire. Now, a lot of this... Uh, credit should go as well to Mavs assistant coach, uh, Jenny. I'm not sure I'm going to say her name right. Bosek? Busek? I'm going to go with Busek. I'm taking a guess here. If I'm wrong, please someone correct me on pronunciation. Uh, Jenny Busek basically tells Carlisle after the third quarter, we need to get Tim a shot, get him going. Again, 13 of his 16 points come in that fourth quarter. She... Has a good suggestion. They run a couple plays, get Hardaway some good looks, and he catches fire and immediately flips the game. A game that had really threatened to pull away from Dallas, kind of like that first Golden State game. This had glimmers of pulling away from Dallas, and instead, Dallas immediately reels in Atlanta, and they're able to build on it. Carlisle, after the game, said that uh, of Tim Hardaway that he is the, quote, ultimate gamer especially when he's playing his former team in Atlanta. So very, very true there. Uh, there was a little extra motivation perhaps for Hardaway to finally get going and break through, and he spearheads a furious fourth quarter charge by the Mavericks. They had basically everything working on the offense in that quarter. They were shooting the lights out from three. They were getting big buckets when they needed it. Dorian Finney-Smith has a big three there in the closing moments as well. Just a lot of things really working 
for Dallas in this. Also in the win, you have another triple-double from Luka Doncic that moves him past Magic Johnson into sole possession of second place for most triple-doubles before age 23. Again, keep in mind, Luka's got until next February to catch Oscar Robertson in that regard, and I think he's like stupid close to catching him even. So all intents and purposes, Luka will surpass him for that for most career triple doubles before the age of 23 crazy but Luca gets you 28 10 and 10 on 9 of 18 shooting two of seven from three he's been shooting the three ball better in the last maybe 10 games but it's not like he's shooting it at a clip of 39 percent we're talking about like 35 percent and it's just kind of because his percentage was what it was it's drawing it up towards a better overall number in that regard. But he's 8 of 10 at the line. He gets a couple blocks and a steal in this game. So Luka, a solid all-around performance here. Uh, the Mavericks also get some real work from Jalen Brunson. He goes off for 21 points, which is the most points he's ever scored off the bench for Dallas. I believe ever. Certainly this season. But I think ever. I uh, heard someone on Twitter say, and I can't remember, I thought I saved the tweet because I wanted to specifically make sure I got that right and give them credit. I cannot find that tweet right now. So I'm just gonna go out on a limb and say, it's this season that it's the most he scored off the bench. I know that much. Uh, nine of 18 for Brunson, two of six from three. And he basically feasted when he had Trey Young on him. So. Good on Jalen, a huge X factor in this game for Dallas, the second leading scorer. Hardaway, again, gets going in that fourth quarter, 13 of his 16 come in there. Willie Cauley-Stein has been playing a little better again. You know, he had a reduced role, a majorly reduced role for a few games there because he started playing badly, let's just say. And he's done a lot better now since he started to get a little bit of burn again. And I think maybe it just kind of woke him up a little bit. Like, I, I don't know. Some guys just need that kick in the pants to really dial back in. And so maybe that's something that he was able to, to accomplish in that regard. Because in 23 minutes, he gets you 14 and 6, 5 of 6 from the field, 4 of 4 at the line. A very, very solid performance for him off the bench. Porzingis struggles with his shot in this game, whereas the first Atlanta game was one of his better games of the year. In 19 minutes, a very reduced uh, minutes opportunity here, but it's because he had five fouls. Uh, that limited his burn a little bit. But he, in 19 minutes, still gives you 15 and four, but it's only six of 14 shooting, including one of five from three. So not a lot going there. He does hit late in the third quarter, a corner three that kind of helped keep Dallas around. So he still had moments, but it wasn't his usual performance. He doesn't get a block in the game. That's a rarity, uh, but he does get you a steal as well. I thought uh, Dallas really got a gritty win with this. Obviously, as I said earlier, pulling this out in the clutch like they did and getting a win at home against a team that, you know, Luke, Luca and Trey are always going to be you know, tied together by history and by perception around the league. And so for Dallas to, in this case, win that battle. Now, Trey Young, a great game as well. Luka played 37 minutes. Trey Young played 42. Trey Young goes for 25, 7, and 15. So flirting with the triple double himself. 8 of 22 from the field. So not a great shooting night. Uh, four of 11 from three, a couple of those were, again, those logo shots he loves to take. He's not terribly efficient in, in like his three point shooting. It seems like when they've played Dallas this year, you know, last game he got going late and led that furious charge to nearly steal that game from Dallas when, where in Dallas snapped a six game losing streak. But this time he kind of was more cooking throughout and, Really making a lot of positive impacts for his team. Obviously, 15 assists is a big number for them. To me, the real thing for Atlanta, and I said this before in the... I don't know if I said it in a stream or a video. I said it in the community chat. I know that. If Atlanta's dumb enough not to give the max to John Collins, dude, I swoop in there and get that dude. 
33 and 8 on 13 of 18 shooting for Collins. One of three from three, six of six at the line, a block, a steal in 38 minutes. The dude. The dude absolutely cooks Dallas. This season, he is absolutely shredding us. If Atlanta is dumb enough not to give him the max and you can pry him away, I go do it. I go and do it. Because that dude is, I think he is very, very good. And I think he's a guy who, you don't have to go get that A-list guy, but you can still get a guy that makes a tremendous positive impact for your team. So that's my thinking there. Uh, Herter also gives them 23-8. and eight. He's definitely got his role for them. He's 4 of 7 from 3. Big shots from him. Can can we stop on the, by the way, the Luka, Trey Young comparison, even when Atlanta fans want to say, like, it's not just Luka versus Trey, it's Trey and Cam Reddish. Well, first you're trying to tell me that Trey is better than Luka. Now you're saying, well, the combination is actually better. Well, Cam Reddish is what, 27 minutes, 7 points, 3 assists, 2 of 7 from the field, 0 of 4 from 3? He didn't do anything the last time they played either. I, I know what, you know, how his inexperience is. But can we have a conversation about that a little bit and just say, like, yeah, you know, you might actually be docking yourself more points in the comparison there. It's not, oh, Trey and Reddish lift up to Luka's level roughly, you might be dipping negative with the reddish impact, at least for now. But I digress. Uh, Dallas here, they get a they dodge a major bullet because on this final possession, Atlanta down one. They're inbounding from half court. There is contact. There is a collision of some sort between I believe it was Willie Cauley Stein and Trey Young. Trey Young stumbles, and as a result. They don't get the ball to Trey Young on the inbound pass. It goes instead to Gallinari, who was 1 of 7 from 3, 2 of 12 in the game, 11 points in 30 minutes of action for Atlanta. The fact that he's who is ending up, and he's a good player. Now, he wasn't having a good game, but he's a good player. The fact that he's who ends up with the ball in his hands for the final shot and not Trey Young is a major benefit because even if Trey Young you know is talking about him being able to knock down big shots it, you not only have that factor but the guy is even to the extent that people say he's ruining the game which is they they pick new moves and new things that they point to that's ruining the game every couple of years first it was the KD rip move on his pull up threes and now here we are to this but um He's a master of drawing fouls, of accentuating contact, and he does not get the foul call. The crew chief afterwards, Josh Tiven, this is from Tim McMahon on Twitter, uh, says via the pool report, he says, quote, in the game, the contact between Young and Collie Stein was deemed incidental, and therefore we didn't have a whistle on the play. After reviewing the play post game, we still, we still, we still feel the no call was the correct decision. Trey Young lost his shit after the game. Got right in the ref's face. Very uh, demonstrative body language and everything. And to be clear, I'm not trying to say like, oh, it was especially horrible, it's unforgivable, the league needs to fine him or suspend him or anything. Not at all. You see this stuff happen all the time. You've seen Luka go after officials like this. But he lost his mind because he, he knows it's a one-point game. Our chances would have been a lot better if I had gotten the ball. And in his mind, he gets knocked to the ground by Willie Cauley-Stein, incidental or not, and that results in Atlanta not getting a good look, really, for the final shot. So Dallas is on a three-game winning streak. They're now going to have the Pelicans. If you recall, the only Dallas game this year that actually got postponed or uh, whatnot was the Pelicans game. So they're going to have to face off now with Zion Williamson, and the physical presence that Steven Adams presents. That is something to consider as you as you make an evaluation of what uh, what Dallas has in store for them. Like they've not had to really contend with Zion this year. And last year they saw him, I think, one time, and Maxi put the clamps on him. You gotta think he's going to be drawing that responsibility again. But this is a very strong physical front court coming up for Dallas. We're going to have to see how KP is able to respond to that. 
and how the team in general is able to contend with it. Because Zion, he is doing crazy things. Bleacher Report's love affair with him has finally dimmed a little bit. Now they've pivoted to uh, LaMelo Ball. So, you know, whatever. It, it, it's kind of funny to me how every year they have a new obsession, and that's all their coverage steers towards that. As a rookie and all that, it was... Luca and then Trey came in and it was like a combination there where towards the end it was maybe 60-40 Luca Trey. Then it was just everything is Zion. Everything, everything, everything is Zion. And now all of a sudden it's largely ball. So Bleacher Report's gonna Bleacher Report. We we know how that works. They're going to drum up and highlight whatever they think is going to get engagement. It's not about any kind of journalism or anything like that or the value of it. They just want to get their internet clout. So that game's coming up tomorrow. It's a 6.30 tip, an earlier game. That's good. We're going to see if Dallas can keep the momentum going because after that, they've got a good matchup with Portland. Dallas is in three more home games now before they hit the road again. Home has not been friendly to them, but they've got a little bit of momentum and their schedule the rest of the year is among the, among the best and most favorable to them so maybe they can build on this momentum and actually allow it to result in a positive streak for the team that gets them back to 500 i believe they're still two games down of 500 right now they're the 11 seed currently uh just a game back of sacramento at the 10 seed let me see for the eight seed they're a game and a half back so they're not out of it they're 12 and 14 but they are on a positive trend. And in the West, the Suns have a four-game winning streak. The Jazz have five. The Lakers have six. But everyone else is there. So, like, you're in the middle of the West in terms of, if you want to look at it in a very small snapshot of basically a week, Dallas is, you know, one of the hotter teams in the West. So maybe they can keep building on this now with some real momentum. Luka's playing great. Dallas is playing great in the clutch. And uh, they're starting to have some guys step up and do a little bit of something, something. So we'll see. I still think there's a lot that needs to be addressed with the team. I still think they're going to have to make major improvements. And I'm still in the camp that we need to consider everything if this doesn't make drastic, drastic gains from, like, like I said, even in this streak, there's been a lot to be desired. Like, Even in that game where they beat the Timberwolves by five, they got outscored in every quarter but one. They blew them out big in the first quarter when KP went nuts and then got outscored the rest of the way in all the other quarters. And they blew a big lead and then they had to hold on for dear life towards the end. That's not good. Like, you took a game that was largely good and fun and you turned it into a nail-biter. It had no business being. That needs improvement. We obviously know... And we talked uh, after the the Warriors game win, what that was. So there's a lot to do and still improve on. It's great that you're winning. That is, at the end of the day, what matters most. But you have a lot of things you need to clean up before you can really, you know, climb back into the playoff picture. And then especially if you want to look into the future and say, all right, now can we be hopeful for this team to possibly win a playoff series? Maybe. But in order to do that, you've got to fix a lot of things before you get there. So that's all my time for this video. If you like it, don't forget to drop a like, leave a comment below, subscribe to the Dallas Prospect. And until next time, remember, every legend was once a prospect. Peace. From Prospect to Legend.